What's up guys, I'm Ari Rochelle and this is Too Deep. We recently started a series on the Nephilim entitled The Nephilim Part 1, The Sons of God and The Nephilim, which you can find under our Too Deep category. Now, if you haven't checked that out, I'd suggest you give it a look because it's quite an interesting study. Now, if you've ever heard of the Nephilim, you'll probably associate the Nephilim with the Sons of God. And as we stated in that video, the sons of God did not produce the Nephilim. They are mentioned as a time period. In fact, let's actually just read that real quick. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is fleshed. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. As we just read, it never actually says that the sons of God and the daughters of men coming together actually produced the Nephilim. As I said earlier, we go into greater detail about this in our video, The Nephilim, Part 1, The Sons of God and The Nephilim, which you can find under our Too Deep category. So who are these sons of God? Well, let's analyze these first two verses real quick. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 through 2. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. It says that man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that caught the attention of the sons of God. Now, if the sons of God were just regular humans, then beautiful women catching their eyes wouldn't really be a big deal. That's not really a time stamp because mankind had been multiplying on the earth which is why more and more daughters were born to them. So the big question then is, what is so special about these sons of God and what exactly makes them sons of God? Well, many claim that the sons of God are the righteous sons of Seth, while the daughters of men are the wicked descendants of Cain. Let's, let's put this into perspective for a second. Not once are any of Adam's descendants, not even Seth himself, called a son of God or a child of God. Not once. Look at what it says about Seth. Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 through 3. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Notice how it says when Adam fathered Seth, Seth wasn't born in the image of God, but in the image of Adam. So not even in God's image or likeness was Seth born, but instead in the image and likeness of Adam, his father. So why? Why is this? Well, because Adam had lost the image of God from the Garden of Eden. That was when he sinned and ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was forbidden for both him and his wife Eve and also for all of their descendants that were to come. That's why in the day he ate of it, he died. We know he didn't die physically because Adam lived to be 930 years old and he went on to father several children. So therefore he had to have died spiritually. Therefore he lost that image and that likeness of God. This is why Jesus had to come to earth. Paul explains this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. This is why we have to be born again as Christ explains to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 1 through 21. This is also why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So if these sons of God aren't just the righteous descendants of Seth, then who are they? Well, as we just read, it says that mankind really began to populate the earth when the sons of God saw or noticed the daughters of men. I know a lot of you are probably like, yes, Ari, we get it. What's your point? Come on, like get on with it. Well, this is the first big event recorded in history as a timestamp, if you will, of God's judgment. This incident is even marked in the New Testament by two different authors. So let's just look at those two passages of scripture real quick. The first one was written by Peter, arguably Jesus' best friend, who was explaining that God's judgment will come to pass. So get it together. Don't be deceived. If he didn't spare the ancient world, he's surely not going to spare you. He's not just going to let you off the hook for your wickedness. So this is what he writes, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4-10. through 10. 
For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Notice the timeline. Peter didn't start with Cain's sin. No, instead he starts with the angels that sinned and are now in chains in Tartarus, not hell, which would need a whole another video to explain. Anyways, they're in chains of gloomy darkness awaiting the final judgment. So who could these angels be that Peter is talking about? What incident could Peter possibly be referring to? We know that it had to happen before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed and before the flood because Peter gives us a timeline. Well, let's compare it to our other verse before we jump to any conclusions. Jude, the brother of James, argues the same exact thing. The only difference? He didn't do things in order. He started with Egypt. So let's just read his account real quick. Jude 5-7 through Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Peter's account seems to explain the order in which things happened, whereas Jude fills in what Peter didn't. So together, we know both the timeline and the sin that was committed. So let's investigate that sin a little deeper. Jude tells us that the angels didn't stay in their position of authority. I just want to quickly clarify that angels aren't a type of celestial being. Angels, that's a job description, which is why Jesus, as well as various celestial beings, terrestrial, supernatural beings, and humans are referred to as angels throughout the scriptures. And for more on that, check out our video, What Are Angels?, which is under our Too Deep category. So with that said, let's decode the first mystery of the sin of these mysterious angels. The first part says, who did not stay within? This is the Greek word, teresantas, which means to keep to keep charge of, to protect, to guard, to observe. So let's just mark this down as we decode the verse. So far we have the angels didn't keep their own. Now the next words to decipher are position of authority. This is the Greek word arken, which means beginning, rulers, authority. It's used 55 times in the New Testament. It's translated as beginning 36 times out of that 55. So 65% of the time, our Ken is translated as beginning. Now, in our video, The Terrestrial Spirits, What Are They?, which is under our too deep category, if you're interested, we talk about the Archangel Michael and his position that Daniel describes as a first prince. Now, I want to clarify, I'm not saying that these angels Jude and Peter are talking about are first princes or chief princes like Michael. I'm not even saying they're celestial. I'm just merely bringing it up. So to add to our investigation, we now have the phrase, the angels didn't keep their own beginning, but... Now, this could mean many things. It could mean that maybe they're like Michael and are archangels, assuming that there's more than one archangel, since the Bible actually never explicitly says that there are multiple archangels. The only archangel's name that we have, or the only archangel that's even brought up to our attention explicitly is Michael. As we said in other videos, we don't believe in extra biblical texts such as the book of Enoch, the book of Esdras, or any other book that is not a part of our Holy Bible. So with that said, I'm not saying that there are or aren't other archangels. That would need so much more digging, which we don't really have the time for in this video. Neither is that what this video is about. So let's just assume that this simply means that these angels didn't keep their beginning as in they didn't keep or protect that which was given to them. 
So the next word to decipher is the word left, which is the Greek word apolipantas. I don't think I pronounced that right. It's fine. Which means to abandon, to give up, to leave. It's used seven times in the New Testament and four out of seven times it is translated as left. The other three times it's translated as remains. But if we actually read those three verses, it could be translated as left and it doesn't actually change the meaning. But for the sake of making it flow better, it is translated as remains. Here's what I mean. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 6 says, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. The word remains could be translated as is left, and it wouldn't change the meaning of the sentence. But remains obviously sounds grammatically better as well as allows the verse to flow better. This is the same with the other two verses found in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10 and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26. So to add to our investigation, we now have the phrase, The angels didn't keep their own beginning but left there. Finally, the last two words we have to decode are proper dwelling. These two words are the Greek word octarion, which means habitation or dwelling. Now, the interesting thing about this word is it's only used one other time in scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 2. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Paul uses the same exact word to describe the heavenly dwelling that we're longing for. Now, at first glance, we may think that Paul is just talking about heaven. But look at what he actually says. Longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Paul says that we're longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, not that we're longing to abide in our heavenly dwelling. Paul isn't talking about the literal third heaven where God abides. Neither is he talking about a room that's in the Father's house. No, Paul is talking about the resurrection and the transformation in the twinkling of an eye. He's talking about a new imperishable body. So then, if we're understanding this accurately, this isn't a physical dwelling place like a house that these angels left. It's something greater. They left their original body or form. So let's just put this all together. The angels didn't keep their own beginning, but left their original form. I think it's pretty safe to say that we can now officially rule out any way that Peter and Jude could be talking about anything other than celestial beings that took on human form forsaking that celestial beginning they were given. Now we know it's possible for celestial angels to take on the form of man. Genesis chapter 19 records two angels that came to Sodom and Gomorrah to save Lot and his family and bring the wrath of God on everyone else who refused to repent. The men of Sodom didn't even know that they were angels. In fact, they demanded Lot to send them out so that they could rape them, essentially. If they had known that those two men were angels, do you really think that they would have demanded Lot send them out so that they could rape them and then threaten to do worse to him if they d- if he didn't? Seriously? You really think they'd be that brazen? No, they wouldn't dare do it. Here's another instance for you. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 1 through 2. It reminds us to show hospitality to strangers because we may be showing hospitality to angels without even realizing it. That would have to include celestial angels as well. Not just humans, but celestial angels as well as supernatural terrestrial angels. So it then has to be possible for angels to take on human form. Therefore, we can come to the safe conclusion that Genesis chapter 6 isn't actually talking about the righteous sons of Seth and the wicked daughters of Cain producing men of renown, but instead it's talking about celestial beings who left their beginning and became like man, to live like man and produce like man. So then that just begs the question, why didn't God just refer to them as angels from the beginning? Why did he make it a point to call them the sons of God? Well, We'll talk of that in the next video. But let's sum everything up in this video real quick. The sons of God aren't the sons of Seth. In fact, they aren't human at all. They're celestial angels that gave up their authority and left behind their celestial body to take on the form of men to live as men. They then procreated with women and their children were the men of renown. This is why their children were so great and mighty because they were half celestial and they were half human. Because they did this, God has chained them in chains of gloomy darkness in Tartarus until the judgment day. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. And until next time, God bless.